My name is Mike Aben and welcome to my KSP campaign. I'm just here in the Research and Development Center looking to spend my 2700 plus science points. And the first one I'm going for because I've been eyeing it for a while here is experimental science. This is to get the better resource gathering equipment I really do want to get into refining the necessary resources in the Kerbin system and get me hauling less stuff up from uh, from Kerbin's surface all the time. Speaking of which, I'm also going to be launching my asteroid miner a little bit later in this episode. This is on its way to the moon, where I do have a B-class asteroid in low orbit about the moon. We'll start experimenting. The idea is for it to start experimenting with uh, resource harvesting. What else is coming up in this episode? Let's see here. Well, we got the Karayan 1. Uh, remember, we had the crew of the Karayan 1 on the surface of Minmus last episode. They're going back to Minmus Station. We'll be sending them on their way back home. And actually, I've got two other launches that you will be seeing. And these are, well, kind of old vessels that I'm uh, putting to use. But I'm going to leave it for a little bit, not talk about them too much just now. Right now, though, I do want to see how I can spend the rest of my science points that I decided upon. Long-term science tech, which has this infrared telescope, hopefully generate more science. I really do want to start concentrating on, on uh, generating science more than funds now. And improved nuclear propulsion for these thermal rocket nozzles. Uh, yeah, I really do want to start going down this nuclear tree and start experimenting with the fun toys that Kerbal Interstellar Extended gives me. And once again, I'm going to be putting the upgrade points the Kerbal Construction Time upgrade points towards generating more science. I am pumping out vehicles more than fast enough from the Vehicle Assembly Building and the Space Plane Hangar. It's science I want to concentrate on. But with that done, let's get ourselves out to Minmus, where we have the Kegel 6, which you saw leaving Minmus's surface at the end of last episode, is now arriving at Minmus Station. And once we're done with the docking, I want to get these folks on their way back to Kerbin as quickly as I can. So uh, after the tr we transferred over the resources, stocked up the Karayan 1, which is going to be the vessel to return these folks back to Kerbin. And uh, actually, I want to take a bit of a closer look at TAC life support and how I'm handling the resources for TAC life support. Because the station here does have a water purifier and oxygen reclamation, so all of the wastewater and the CO2 I'm going to pump to the station. But the Karayan I'm going to stock up with everything else, and also it's going to take all of the solid waste. I don't have any use for poo, so it's going to return it back to Kerbin surface and eventually to the surface, though. As I'm saying that, I'm thinking, why do I worry about taking poo back to the surface? Um, I really should. I do have these uh, KAS uh, valves that you can use to purge resources. I should really just start putting those valves on everything and purge that poo into space. But oh well. Uh, it is what it is right now. And uh, I'll get Carol. And the first thing Carol's going to do is transfer over the science from the lander over to the Karain 1. I've really gotten into a bad habit of kind of forgetting that, so I'm making this priority number one. Uh, in fact, Kerbin Station right now has a whole bunch of uh, low altitude, like near space gravity science that it has collected that I keep forgetting to take down to curb and surface and I kind of do want that science. And then of course we'll transfer over Bill and Jeb and then we'll undock and then it comes time to start to plot our departure. And I don't know, I'm in a hurry. <laughs> I got a lot of fuel so I just, I'm just going to burn straight out of here. I'm not going to worry about inclination changes or using the overbirth effect or anything like that. I'm just going to the, the blast straight on out of here. Uh, though thinking about inclination once in Kerbin sphere of influence is something I'm slowly starting to get a little bit better at. I've been burned in the past uh, coming in from Minmus and trying to get to Kerbin Station. Remember Kerbin Station is in an equatorial orbit in low orbit about Kerbin. So I would want to get my inclination down to zero. Um... 
But the best thing to do is just think about this in advance uh, and make sure that either the ascending or the descending node of your resulting orbit about Kerbin is going to be far away from Kerbin so that you can make a relatively cheap inclination change. And I'm slowly learning to think about this in advance. I've been burned two or three times on it. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm a slow learner, but I do eventually learn. So here we are just performing that ejection burn. Not going to take us too long. We are just about there. There we go, that ought to do it. Okay, so let's get out into map view and see what our resulting orbit is like. Getting down to periapsis in just under 12 days. Uh, yeah, it's a little longer than normal. That's because uh, because of the inclination of the polar orbit we just exited from, we are actually carrying our, it's carrying us out past Mimis' orbit before coming in towards Kerbin again. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have been in such a rush. <laughs> Should have done some inclination changing. and get there a little bit far. Oh, well, it is what it is now. It's not going to be too bad. Anyway, let's get ourselves back to Kerbin's surface. This is my asteroid miner, which I did preview a few episodes ago in the vehicle assembly building. I was hoping to get it into my space shuttle, but it's just a little bit too big. That's okay, you'll be seeing the Columbia next episode for sure. I got some other missions for it. It is a little bit wobbly. Let's see if we can turn down the gimbling here a little bit more but honestly that's not too bad I, I, I I'm a little bit I was actually a little bit surprised by this I uh, in testing it was way more wobbly than this I mean it got into orbit so I said I went with it but before it was wobbling so much that it was actually peeking in and out of the fairing the payload was peeking in and out of the fairing up there at the top but this this looks this looks fine this looks sweet And the reason why it is is kind of wobbly and unstable is because of this huge stack of batteries that we have here. I did finally stiffen it up with a, a long strut that just went right across all the batteries, and that, I guess that was the final thing that stiffened it up. And these batteries are necessary for the ore refinery to work through the night side of its orbit. It's going to be in orbit, and as it goes through the night side, of course, it won't be getting any solar power. Uh, I do have an RTG coming very, very soon. You can see why I am eager for it, so that I can do these kind of things and not have to worry about sunshine all the time. Also, the vessel is mounted upside down, so the heavy part is up at the top, which doesn't help with stability either during ascent. But it was just easier to attach it that way. I got this really nice encounter, too. I'm going to be coming in pretty much at the right inclination right away. No need to wait. Not that it really matters, because this thing has to wait for the Corian 3 to arrive anyway, and the Corian 3 isn't going to be getting into the Moon's Sphere of Influence for about another dozen days. And the reason for that is because I didn't put RCS on this thing, um, and it needs to attach, which really means dock, with the asteroid that's there, and I was going to depend on the Corian 3 to dock with it, and then the Corian 3 was going to maneuver it into the right position, so we got to wait for the Corian 3. Oh, well. That's the way it turned out. But why don't we just jump right into the moon's sphere of influence. Got a very small inclination adjustment to make here. I want to get the ascending node right onto periapsis. Okay, just need to do a few more puffs. Oh, that'll do it. Oh, jeez. It's only a 0.7 degree difference here. That's awesome. And then, of course, we're going to perform our capture burn here at Periapsis. And I'm not too picky exactly where I'm going to be leaving my resulting Apoapsis, other than to leave it nice and high, because my descending node is now going to be out there towards Apoapsis, and leaving it nice and high means that my inclination change up there is going to be itsy-bitsy. So we're going to make a tiny little itsy-bitsy inclination change. And then I'm just going to leave it here. 
Uh, we got to leave it here and wait for the Karayan 3 to show up, and then I'll do my final rendezvous with the asteroid. So again, that's not going to be for about another dozen days. In the meantime, after just a little bit more time warping, well, the launch pad had been reconditioned, and I was all set for another launch. Well, here's a control panel that you haven't seen for a little while. I think I'm going to stay in uh, interior view for a little bit because I want to keep this vessel a little bit of a mystery, though it is a vessel you have seen before. Anyway, you are watching this through the eyes of Stella! And beside her right here is Burrick, our two pilots that are the only Kerbals that I have on the surface. Clearly not on the surface anymore because they are in the process of showing that we can collect science without needing a scientist once again. They are on their way into a polar orbit and to collect low and high gravity science about Kerbin. Specifically, I'm missing the ice caps in the Badlands from uh, low orbit around Kerbin and the ice caps of Badlands in the Tundra from high orbit around Kerbin. So these folks' job is to simply collect that, get that back down to the surface. So it is Interesting to note now that actually once these folks are in space, I will have every single one of my Kerbals in space, at least for a little while. That's 20 Kerbals. That's ridiculous. And I still need to get some more because I don't have scientists or engineers on Kerbin's surface. But anyway, uh, why don't we, while we're doing this ascent, talk about my quick and dirty calculation that I do to calculate what Delta V I need to get into... Uh, a polar orbit about Kerbin, because you do need a little bit more delta V than you normally do. Now, first of all, what I do is I calculate what my orbital velocity is in my standard sort of 80 kilometer orbit, and that's 2,280 meters per second. Now, for a prograde orbit, whoop, there goes my boosters. For a prograde orbit, uh, we are already moving eastward at 175 meters per second due to Kerbin's rotation, so we only need to add 2,105 meters per second to our velocity, but of course the cost is a lot more than that. It costs, I typically budget around 3,550 meters per second of vacuum delta V to get into orbit, and this is of course because we have to increase our altitude, and this is sometimes called gravity drag, and more significantly we have to overcome atmospheric drag. So let's take that 3,550 meters per second and divide it by the 2,105 meters per second. It gets me 1.69. I'm going to call this number my drag factor. Now for a polar orbit, you still have to get to the same orbital velocity of 2,280 meters per second, but now you are moving perpendicularly to Kerbin's rotation. So to combine those two velocities together, you have to use the Pythagorean theorem. That gets me 2,290 meters per second. We'll multiply that by the drag factor of 1.69 to get 3,870 meters per second. So there it is. That's my quick and dirty calculation for what I need to get into a polar orbit. I say it's about 3,870 meters per second. So this vessel's beefed up just a little bit with an extra booster to be able to accomplish that. Anyway, we've just ditched our main booster. And I'm just waiting to get a little bit closer to Apoapsis. There we go. We'll start burning with the orbiter here to circularize our orbit. And I suspect people are already beginning to figure out what this vessel is, but I'll, I'll leave you in suspense just a little while longer while I finish off our orbital insertion. There we go, that's pretty good. And uh, actually, let's take a look at our resulting orbit here on the map. Our orbital view doesn't seem to really like this, but uh, let's take a look at our ScanSat map. Oh, this looks pretty good here. You can see our trajectory going up here, a nice polar orbit. But uh, let's keep everybody out of suspense for now. Here is our vehicle. It is the good old Kuryus. It's, uh-oh. Oh, I, I think I may have lost my solar panels. 
Uh oh, it looks like a panel's glitched in there, but it's not working. That must have happened at fairing separation. Oh, the joys of being in cockpit view. I should really stop using these old solar panels. Oh, well, let's open up the uh, engine cover here. I mean, I do have new retractable solar panels. I'm just a bit of a nostalgist. I just like the look of these old panels. So I've just got the ScanSat map up here and I'm just waiting to get over the ice caps to, ki to grab our first bit of science. There we go. Best not transmit this. We're gonna need to keep that electricity in reserve. Okay, let's get out Burke. And he'll go out there and collect that science. He has gotta go, where's, oh, it's a little bit to the left here. Oops, clicked on the ScanSat map by mistake. There it is, come on Burke, collect that science. There we go. If you take a look at X science down there at the bottom right, you can see sort of all those bars, part of them are in light blue. Ooh, the communitron here is extended. I should descend that, save some electricity. Um, all of that that's in light blue is actually science that has been collected, but not by this vehicle. That's all science that I collected. I can't even remember when, but it's sitting on curb and station right now. But, uh, I might as well get these guys to collect what they can. Yeah, Burke's taking a look at this solar panel. You can't fix this. You're not an engineer, silly. And it would be nice to have, I think you have to be a level two engineer to fix solar panels, but regardless, we can't do anything about it. So yeah, all that light blue science and stuff sitting on curb and station, but we might as well collect it here. Now part of that I can see is magnetometer science. So why don't we go up here, take a look at the magnetometer. Yep, might as well collect that. I mean, these guys are gonna be going down very, very soon as opposed to, I don't know when I'll get around to getting somebody to come down from Curban Station. So might as well grab this now and kind of beat them to the punch, so to speak. Come on, there it is. Take data. Burke back in. The science instruments are just out of his reach. I could put him into the orbital module and he probably could get out and actually reach the science from there but I'm paranoid about putting him in the orbital module and forgetting that he's in the orbital module and then when I go to detach it, whoa, the panel just came loose. Speaking of things detaching, that's that panel that was glitched. It's now floating away. As I was saying, um, I'm paranoid about putting people in the orbital module because I should be descending these folks fairly soon once I'm out of electricity. And uh, that orbital module will burn up in the atmosphere and then given me, I would probably forget I have somebody in there and so I'll just keep them in the descent module. Keep everything safe. Anyway, uh, well, we ended up going around. I grabbed some highlands and some grasslands, water shores, deserts, and mountains um, while we were going around. Unfortunately, I never could get to the Badlands. Our orbit wasn't carrying us up to that. And I could see that my electricity was getting pretty low, so I thought, why don't I get up to high orbit now? So I'll start burning prograde and, oh, oh, shoot. My electricity is not going up. This engine doesn't have an alternator. It can't generate electricity. Okay, that's it then. <laughs> it's time to bring this mission to a close. We're going to end this right now. Start my descent burn and we'll have to try this again in the future. And in fact, it wasn't long after performing that descent burn that my electricity was completely gone. <laughs> so here I am time warping... Uh, Getting a nice spinning action going here. But that's okay. Uh, the capsule itself doesn't need electricity to orient itself retrograde. Natural aerodynamics took care of that. So these folks got back down to the surface without any issue. And then it was time to actually get the Kuryus going again. Yeah, I had two of them being built, except this one has no science equipment on it. It's not going in a polar over it. In fact, isn't even crude.
This is just too versatile a vehicle not to have one handy. I mean, it has over 800 meters per second of delta V. It can carry up to five Kerbals, can descend three. Um, it's, it's just a really handy vehicle to have around, at least when it has its solar panels. Um, so this is on its way to Kerbin Station. I don't have any crew in it because I'm not interested in doing a crew rotation. All I'm interested in is having this thing available when it's up there. Kind of a funny thing though that did happen, I found, like, it's been a long time since I did this build, obviously since I launched one of these Kuryuses, I don't know how many episodes it was, but I found that this thing was crazy overbuilt now. I had to kind of scale it back, put less boosters, take less fuel out. I don't know if homegrown rockets updated their engines, or perhaps there was a tech node that upgraded the engines for me. I mean, I know Kerbal Interstellar Extended does that, that there are tech nodes that actually upgrade equipment. I don't know. But it is nice having this little bit more spelt lifter for this vehicle. Why don't we stick around with this shot? Because we are coming up to booster separation. There we go. Anyway, like I was mentioning, this thing is just on its way to Kerbin Station. It does have a probe core in it, so it can fly without having a crew. And as you can see, as it's approaching Kerbin Station here, that I still do have those old homegrown rocket uh, panels. They didn't break off this time. I don't know. Just got unlucky, I guess, before. Um, this will be the last time you'll probably be seeing these panels, because in future builds, I will be using the more modern, retractable panels. So this is the end of this particular look. I do like this look, though. And once docked, I took advantage of being up here again to do a little bit more house cleaning with the station. I got Gilly into the other Dreamweaver here and decided I was going to move it over to that third radial docking port anyway. I realized that all I needed to do was just turn, roll the vessel just a little bit. And it would dock here just fine without the wing tips touching. There we go, that looks good. I think it would look even better if I took the other Dream Weaver and just rolled it a little bit the other way, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's fine the way it is. I'm not going to bother doing that. And then I put Wilman in charge of starting to clean up the stuff, the Kerbal attachment system and Kerbal inventory system stuff that's been just collecting up here. Um, I got a ton of internal storage, so my goal was to get everything into internal storage, which I did, and now that everything is in these internal storage containers instead of the external storage containers and lockers, I can actually move things around without having to EVA folks. And so this allowed me to do some organization and finally a decent inventory so I can take a look at what we got up here, what we have too much of, what we need more of. So that's going to be helpful. I'll have to think about that the next time I send up some supplies. And I might as well check on science while I'm up here. Wow, 126 science. Oh my goodness, these guys are generating 16.3 science per day. I gotta get more science labs going. I gotta, I gotta up... That's, I think, what I'm going to try and put some priority in when the Karayans get back, is send some more folks out of Kerbin's sphere of influence just to get out their orbit the sun for a moment and come back again, just to get them up to level three and then get some more labs going. Really start generating science. You can actually see the science ticking up here. You can visually see science being made. This is awesome. Okay, well... It's time to leave Kerbin Station. It's in a nice state, so uh, let's get back to MapSat 8, which I launched last episode, but it is now getting into Minmus's sphere of influence. Now, this being a mapping satellite, I want to put it into a polar orbit, specifically a polar orbit with an altitude of 750 kilometers, because that's the ideal altitude for the high-res altimeter that is attached to this thing. And you know, I've always been a bit unsure of if you're going to insert yourself into an orbit around another body should you just go for the direct capture in other words you put your periapsis at the altitude you want 750 kilometers in this case and then just do the single capture burn there to get a circular orbit of that altitude or 
Are you better off bringing your periapsis in nice and close to the planet, getting your capture there, taking advantage of the O-birth effect, and uh, then circularizing when you get back out to apoapsis? And I finally got down and just, I'm going to do the math of this. And I did a mathematical analysis of all of this kind of stuff, uh, made spreadsheets and charts and everything. And turned out the answer was, it depends. It depends upon the strength of the gravitational field of the body about which you're about to get your orbit around. It depends upon the velocity at which you are coming into the sphere of influence at. But for Minmus, the cheaper thing to do is to actually take advantage of the Oberth effect. So I'm uh, going to get my capture here at an altitude of about 10 kilometers, but I'm going to stop when my apoapsis hits 750 kilometers. And then at 750 kilometers, I'll set up another burn uh, that will do the circularization, and then I'll end up in this 750 kilometer orbit. Uh, I, I'll admit the difference with Minmus is pretty freaking negligible, but I thought, well, you know, why not do it the cheaper way? Anyway, with that accomplished, why don't we finish this with the crew that we started this episode with aboard the Korion 1. And they are just about ready to make this 8.7 meter per second burn to change their inclination from 10 degrees down to zero. See how useful it is to do these things when you're far away from Kerbin? Okay, I'm just into puffs now. Looking at this now, I realize I really should be doing this with RCS, not with the main engines. I'm just looking at, oh my god, oh, and then of course I overdid it. But 0 0.02 inclination according to Kerbal Engineer, that's good enough. And with that accomplished, it was time to set up our aero braking. Got my, uh, I got my ap periapsis, sorry, at 42 kilometers, and according to trajectories, this means I'll be putting pulling 1.5 G's going through there. This is my first aero brake with the uh, new air brakes. They're not new. I just finally thought of patching them to this thing. <laughs> but it's the first time using them for aero braking. So I'm being a little bit cautious, keeping my periapsis a little bit higher. It should be okay. But we won't be finding out for another five and a half days. In the meantime, I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.